I want to address pain tonight. Arthritis obviously is a very big common source of pain, but there are others. Uh, and and we're going to talk about natural solutions that don't have side effects. Okay. So I will ask you to please uh, quieten your cell phone so that you could really focus. As I said, I'm going to say some stuff that's going to be totally new for many of you. And it is extremely critical. It can really help you transform your life. So let's um, let you really focus and, 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 uh, and be tuned to this, okay? So, you know, the average person is on multiple drugs after the age of 60. Uh, about seven medications is fairly an average number for people. Um, it seems that... Um, our approach to healthcare really resolves around medications. When you go to the doctor, usually that's kind of what you what you end up with. You know, the way our system works is the first question is, well, geez, what condition does the med uh, does this patient have? So when we're in training, they teach us how to make a diagnosis. Once you know what the diagnosis is you can look up which drug is the right answer for that patient. And that's about where you end up. We learn about biochemistry. We learn about pharmacology, which is a study of drugs. And then we, we are taught how to prescribe drugs. That's about where it ends. We are not taught lifestyle. We are not taught stress management. We're not taught nutrition. So as doctors, we, we are really, really taught drug medicine. And hence... Your doctor only knows drug solutions because that's what your doctor is um, educated in. The pharmaceutical companies, you know, they advertise like crazy and they manipulate how we think and what we think. And, um, you know, the whole idea of advertising pharmaceutical drugs to the public, um, I think is uh, seriously something that we should reconsider. So. When someone develops a chronic disease, um, it, it's awesome for the drug companies because then they're going to be on this drug for life. Um, our healthcare system, and this is before COVID-19, right? Extremely expensive, 3.5 trillion. Uh, anybody know how many zeros that has? Uh, it's a ton. Um, and, and why? Why do we have this crazy healthcare system? It's the most expensive healthcare system in the world, but yet it's one of the worst uh, as far as developed nations go. And, and this is really the answer. Our healthcare system is really a business. Its objective is to make money. Its objective is not to heal people, not to make people well, not to make the countries health better overall, um, and, and, and it, that's what it achieves. So who am I and what am I doing with a syringe and an apple? Uh, for those of you that don't know me. Um, so I have my roots in conventional medicine. I went to uh, University of Louisville School of Medicine. Um, I then did a surgical residency and had a neck surgery and beyond um, beyond that, um, I, I have kind of been on a journey. So initially what happened was that um, I did great in medical school, high school, college. I was a star student, no problem. Got into residency and uh, they almost replaced me. It became uh, very difficult for, for me. I could not keep up with my job as a resident. I basically was um, really struggling to, um, to keep up, making it to rounds very hard. I had just gotten married before residency. So uh, marriage and the uh, residency, it just was not working out. And I went to see a doctor because I'd had a bulgy thyroid in my neck. And they had told me, oh, your thyroid is borderline. No treatment is needed. Go back in six to 12 months. Well, I kept going back and I didn't do anything. And now I knew something was wrong. So I went back again 
And again, they tell me, eh, you know, your thyroid is borderline. No treatment is necessary. I, I bet that's a line some of you guys have heard, that your labs are borderline or your labs are normal, but you sure as heck don't feel normal. And so that's kind of where I was at. Um, fortunately, uh, before I got kicked out of residency, um, they, um, uh, I had the opportunity to get a second opinion. And second opinions were always valuable. This doctor did start me on Synthroid. He checked my antibodies. They were through the roof. And so I started feeling a little better, but not quite. Uh, within a couple of months, I was back to being lethargic and slow. And every step I took required a sheer act of willpower. And from that level, then, I was rescued by one of my previous medical school professors who had just figured out a whole new way of uh, optimizing thyroid function. And so he kind of helped me out. And I got my thyroid in tune. And before I knew it, I was leading to fighting and surgery, surgery rounds. Come on, guys, let's go. Uh, a whole shift from dragging every step in front of the other was a challenge for me initially. So, so kind of knowing that, I knew that there were, there were better ways um, so, so at Hopkins, I was blessed to be uh, educated and trained by the top authorities in the world. But as I had struggled with the standard healthcare, I saw my patients also struggling. And then about that time, my mom came down with uh, lots of chronic autoimmune conditions. And you know, so we took her to the best doctors that we could, and they couldn't really help her. She suffered year after year after year. Um, I had to keep finding solutions and ways to help her suffer. And that put me on this journey. And I remember being really, really frustrated and, and, and talking to God at times, like, God, why are you teaching me this way? Why are you making my mother suffer? And then I learn how to do this. And then I learn how to do this. And unfortunately, this type of medicine, this is how it happens. Most doctors' eyes are open only through personal suffering and suffering of their loved ones. Otherwise, doctors uh, totally have their eyes closed and they don't see the deficiencies in the system around them. I, I learned because of personal experience and that put me on this journey. So Johns Hopkins Medicine, as advanced and awesome as it was, had a lot of holes in it because it didn't address the whole person and it didn't really, really get the right answers for chronic disease. And so, so, so mom was one of my big teachers and unfortunately she suffered as I tried to figure things out and her illness was always one step ahead of me. So for those of you guys joining in late, we're going to talk about um, some of the issues that are causing our healthcare problems, not just COVID-19, but before that, we can talk about healing and uh, disease-causing foods. We're going to talk about pain relief that actually heals and that actually is good for the body. So uh, hold on to your seats. You're going to hear some pretty cool stuff. So causes of chronic pain, um, injury, right? So you get injured, you break your arm, um, causes pain, it's healing, maybe it doesn't heal fully well, and you can have a persistent problem, right? Uh, ankle sprains, whatever, some injury, right? Known diseases, diseases, autoimmune disease, but it knows OA is osteoarthritis, RA is rheumatoid arthritis. So both of those cause pain. Their mechanisms are felt to be different, okay? Um, autoimmune, we're gonna talk about what exactly that means. Cancer uh, also has a way of causing a lot of pain as well as disability uh, and, and debility. And so we're gonna talk about these and how we can approach it um, using uh, some non-standard approaches. Um, I'm going to ask you guys to take a little poll because 
Uh, as you can see here, chronic pain affects up to 40% of us. And the number of opioid prescriptions, if there's 100 people in the room, okay, in 2012, for every 100 people, 81 opioid prescriptions were written. That doesn't mean 81 people got them. It means that perhaps 81 um, prescriptions were handed out to maybe 30 patients, but some of them got repetitive ones. But that's still an awful lot of prescriptions. You can see there is a trend down, and that's because of the big addiction problem we, we got. So, so I have a quick little poll here for you. Um, please uh, check yes or no. Have you ever been on a narcotic medication? Let's actually specify. Yeah, okay. No for whoever said initially. Uh, everybody, please take a moment and click yes or no. I find that hard to believe, all right? We've got 25.75, all right, keep going. So narcotic pain medication, I'm just thinking to myself, um, I am sure for some post-surgery I was given something, but that's been a long time ago. So yeah, so it looks like about 40% have been prescribed narcotics at some point in their life. 40, 45, 46, looks like it's hitting 50, 50. Okay, all right, thank you. So, um, so narcotics are used um, widely. Um, they are um, one of the approaches that is taken to pain. Other ones, the NSAIDs, right? You know that some of these have been taken off the market because they were killing people. Um, some of them are still on the market, causing side effects. They, um, they can range from excessive uh, bleeding and bruising to very serious hemorrhages. Um, acetaminophen, Tylenol, right? Overdoses uh, result in liver, liver problems, but not the bleeding issues, and the narcotics. So these are kind of the things directly uh, that uh, attack the uh, pain um, producing nerve endings and, and the sensation of pain is reduced with these. Other techniques, again, more drugs. Corticosteroids, they cut down inflammation so they can also control pain. Muscle relax, uh, relaxants, anti-anxiety drugs, antidepressants, anti-convulsants, right? So this, this is kind of the laundry list that people get for, uh, for pain relief, okay? I wanna talk now, I'm gonna kind of move in the direction that we, we, we uh, are here for. And that is, what is the functional medicine approach? Well, right there. First, what, what, what's the cause? Okay. In functional medicine, we're always looking for what is the underlying cause? Okay. There are different potential underlying causes. Is it genetics? Was there an injury? Is there toxicity? Are there infections? Okay. And, and I got a little V there next to... Uh, infections, and that V is for vaccine. We're going to talk about vaccines and their effects too as well. Um, nutrition, right? Is there a nutritional issue? Is there a lifestyle issue? Okay, so we want to identify this. Now, uh, remember, conventional approach is simply to make the diagnosis. I don't care what caused it, right? This person has rheumatoid arthritis. Why? The patient has an infection. The patient toxic. What, what happened? That, that's what needs to be figured out, okay? So let's talk a little bit about the immune system. The immune system basics, as I like to say, the immune system is amazingly intelligent, I guess as is the rest of the body in miraculous ways. The immune system knows self from non-self. So this is me, and and uh, something else is not me. So if you know there's a parasite that uh, gets into my body, my immune system knows that that's not me. Okay. If there's a bacteria uh, that gets in and starts an abscess, my immune system knows, hey, that's not me. It also knows uh, friend versus foe. Okay. So let's see that grain of pollen. Well, geez, it doesn't bother most people, but it drives me crazy. So um, my immune system doesn't regard the pollen necessarily as a friend and it kind of mounts an 
unnecessary response, which results in allergy. So, so the immune system, two main reasons. It's got to know self from non-self. It's got to know what is friend versus foe. Okay? And, and if the body can't recognize what is friend and what is foe, it's going to launch a major attack against something totally innocuous, hence the allergy issue. If the immune system can't recognize self, okay, then what happens? Then we get what's called autoimmunity. My immune system thought my thyroid gland was not mine and attacked. This is Hashimoto's thyroiditis and it leads to the immune attack by my own body, renders my thyroid gland incapable of producing an adequate amount of thyroid hormone. And so I end up hypothyroid, okay? So this is autoimmunity in a nutshell. And if you ask conventional medicine what causes autoimmunity, they're gonna say, oh, we don't know, okay? Got another poll for you guys, are awesome. So this is, do you have an autoimmune condition? This has become exceedingly common, exceedingly common. Um, autoimmune disease is hugely on the rise. Over the last 20 years, it has really increased uh, incidence so that more and more people are being affected by this. So our immune system obviously are not working right. Something is off, okay? Um, Oh, boy, I goofed on this one, guys. Let's take the top one as yes, and the middle one as no. Ignore the bottom. Looks like I'm putting this uh, full incorrectly. So the top is yes, the middle is no, okay? So where are you in terms of, okay, so I've got more yeses. So where it says 100%, that means yes, okay? And the other, both of them I'm going to take as a no. So it looks like a good many of you guys look at look at that incidence you know if we took this poll 30 years ago it would not be nearly so it might be like 10 percent or less and now we're hitting like half and half so i apologize for my little mishap here i am new to this webinar webinar jam so as you can see i'm fumbling a little bit so my apologies so in the autoimmune issues, um, let's talk a little bit about what causes autoimmunity and inflammation in the body. Inflammation, we know, is the underlying cause for everything from heart disease to schizophrenia to um, autoimmunity, okay? So obviously there is a genetic tendency. We definitely see uh, clusters, right? Families tend to have autoimmunity. I definitely have autoimmunity in my family. Um, my mother had a bunch of autoimmune stuff. Um, my father was hypothyroid. I am obviously hypothyroid. I have two sisters that also have hypothyroidism. So, so it is exceedingly um, uh, common. Um, drugs. Drugs is another big cause, and that's something, again, not mentioned. What causes autoimmunity? Conventional medicine. say, oh, we don't know. Okay, and that's wrong. I'm going to show you they do know. Uh, chemicals cause autoimmunity and inflammation. Infections cause autoimmunity and um, inflammation. And some of these infections, we do not have straightforward conventional treatments for. Some of the viruses, right? You guys know what we're going through with COVID because we don't have a treatment, okay? Whereas if you had a bacterial infection, you could very simply prescribe an antibiotic that covered the bacteria. We're having trouble there too because the bacteria are getting smarter and they are resistant to our older antibiotics and our drug companies keep having to invent new ones. Of course, it costs a lot of money, so they charge a lot of money, okay? Um, lifestyle also plays into inflammation. Okay, uh, just think about what you eat. You know, if you're having McDonald's for dinner every night, what's that going to do to your body versus some other choices? So uh, lifestyle, big role. So if we can control these, genetic tendency, ah, it is what it is, right? You, you're born with the genes you got. Right now, um, we're still kind of uh, 
just tiptoeing in towards uh, being able to manipulate those genes. But so far, we, we've got some control in the bottom four, and, and that's what we want to we wanna address here. Okay. So this is a list of drugs and chemicals, not a complete list, but you can see partial list, and I know it's pretty small, but these are things confirmed to cause autoimmunity. Okay, gold, cadmium, mercury. Geez, what do we find mercury, right? The ophimerosol in vaccines, right? In our mouths with all those amalgam, okay? In all the um, food that we eat, especially seafood. I've had so many patients that try to eat healthy, and it's oh, the only meat I eat is fish. And I check their mercury levels, and they're all elevated. It's like you can't live, okay? Um, other uh, chemicals are going to be drugs. So towards the bottom uh, part of the list, you're seeing drugs, and there's also environmental chemicals, vinyl chloride, silica dust. These things all have a known autoimmune association. So, so look at the list of drugs, everything from myasthenia gravis, autoimmune thyroid disease, pemphigus, okay? autoimmune hepatitis, systemic sclerosis, lupus, Okay, so these, we, we do know that, and these chemicals are bad for us, no matter what they tell you. Oh, you don't need to eat organic, don't worry about all these pesticides. Wrong. Let's talk about infections. Okay, so there are a number of things that can cause infections. If you look at the left, um, CMV, EBV, those are viruses, okay? Um, Going further down, you'll see you see a lot of EBV. That is the monovirus that is known to cause a lot of issues, including chronic fatigue and certain cancers. Okay, um, there are other agents as well, bacteria, for example, uh, Proteus and Klebsiella. These are associated uh, Proteus with rheumatoid arthritis potentially. Okay, Klebsiella with a condition called ankylosing spondylitis. If you look at mechanisms, mechanism means how do these organisms trigger autoimmunity? This is molecular mimicry. What the heck is that? Um, but you see that? That's pretty much down the entire row there. Um, Coxsackie, it says no specific uh, activation, non-specific activation, but everything else pretty much saying molecular mimicry. So let's talk about what is molecular mimicry. So... On the right, you see a little virus figure, and that virus is attaching to an immune cell, a T cell, okay, uh, one of the white blood cells. And that antibody uh, that it forms to that virus also seems to look like something uh, it seeks out and connects with something on part of their own, the person's own body cells. So you see how the um, what what the, was developed as an antibody to the virus, an antibody also sees a similar structure to the virus on the person's own cells. So the theory is that your immune system reacts to some bacterium, but the reaction kind of also starts seeing a part of the body as that bacterium and starts to attack. So that is molecular mimicry, and that is a mechanism that I wanted to explain to you because uh, there is a therapy that makes takes advantage of that mechanism, okay? Um, infections and autoimmune diseases. This is a review that, um, um, you know, most of these type of uh, articles actually are not written in the U.S. And the U.S., if it's not investigating a drug, we usually don't care about it, unfortunately. So this is in the Journal of Autoimmunity, and, and what they're saying is, they say, um, it definitely, study of animal models shows that infections can definitely trigger autoimmune disease, um, even things like type 1 diabetes, okay, Guillain-Barre syndrome, okay. Um, so one may assume that unknown viruses may be at the origin of a number of chronic autoimmune diseases, such as diabetes type 1 and multiple sclerosis. Um, so just because we don't know, we have not confirmed the link, doesn't mean it doesn't, it doesn't exist. There is a lot of evidence pointing to the fact that some underlying infection is triggering 
an immune system and the immune system is getting confused and attacking a part of the body. What part of the body gets attacked depends on what the triggering organism is, the person's tendency uh, towards autoimmunity genetically, as well as the person's lifestyle and their diet and nutrition. So all that goes in, okay? Um, I have another little uh, poll here for you guys. Let's see if I did this one right. So when I was in medical school, we didn't really know what autism was, okay? Yeah, it was a long time ago I was in medical school, but um, anymore, the frequency of autistic children is really, really risen up. And med school, even going through the education, I had not really heard about autism. And I tell you, over my career of about two decades, well, over two decades now, um, it's, it's everywhere. Um, almost everyone I know has someone they know, a friend or a relative's child or their own child that has autism. Um, oh my gosh. Okay. So um, it is telling me that 64% of you guys, 66, know someone who has an autistic child. Okay. Either you someone in your family, a friend, somebody you know who has an autistic child. And what does that tell you? It's pretty darn common, 68%. So two thirds, 70, it just keeps going up guys. Uh, it, it's just, this is devastating. I, I have a friend as well who has an autistic child and it is, um, it's, it's challenging for the rest of their lives, for the rest of, the child's life as well as both parents' lives. So you guys have given me about 72% that of you that know. That, that is huge. Right. So that sheds a light. Uh, depressing light, but uh, a light. So let's talk about vaccines and autoimmunity. Okay? Um, there are, again, a number of published studies in very reputable journals not throwaway stuff, uh, but again, this is also not US-based. Uh, in this review of the literature, there is evidence of vaccine-induced autoimmunity and adjuvant, that's what they put in the vaccines to make them more immune-stimulating, induced autoimmunity in both experimental models as well as human patients. So you got it, vaccines causing autoimmunity. The vaccines have intentionally been made to stimulate the immune system. When they stimulate the immune system, sometimes the immune system goes a bit out of whack and, and gets confused and starts attacking self, autoimmunity, okay? So, so that is a huge concern because as you guys indicated, so much autoimmunity is, is out there. Um, this is in the journal Lupus, okay? Another very reputable autoimmune journal. Mechanisms of aluminum, okay? These vaccines don't just, you know, in the past it was all mercury, mercury in vaccines. Well, it's aluminum. Aluminum is hugely toxic to the brain, especially to a young groined brain. And, and this is a lot of information, but this is so important. I had to just take my little highlighter and highlight the whole thing. It says immune challenges, like by vaccines that occur early in the development, can cause permanent detrimental alterations on the of the brain and the immune function. Permanent. So so these immune challenges, which is by vaccines can cause permanent changes to brain and immunity, okay? It says experimental evidence shows that simultaneous administration, so three at multiple at a time, of as little as two to three immune adjuvants can overcome genetic resistance to autoimmunity. Geez, so if you combine these adjuvants, they're more toxic than one alone, okay? And, and in the developed countries, and yes, we are a developed country here in the U.S., by the time kids are four to six, you know that nowadays they're getting 
you know, they're going in and get five vaccines at one visit. Two months later, they get me four or five more. So these kids, by the time they're four to six, have received a total of 126 antigenic compounds. Think about those immunities, uh, those uh, immune systems, and aluminum adjuvants. So they've gotten so much aluminum that it's known to be toxic to their brains, but nobody bothers to sit there and add it up. The pediatrician seems to not pay attention to that. He's just told, here's your vaccine schedule, here's what you're gonna do, doctor, and he just obliges. So, you know, the FDA has an attitude that vaccines are safe and they're not toxic and therefore they're really not studied. So this, you know, what do they say? This raises plausible concerns about the overall safety of current childhood vaccination programs. So, uh, you know, yet there's so much fight. They want to vaccinate every child. The parents that don't want their children vaccinated are being threatened with, you can't send the kid to the school if you don't vaccinate them, it's a problem. Healthcare workers, they can't go to work if they're not vaccinated with the flu vaccine. It's, it's, it's mandatory, okay? In adult humans, aluminum vaccine adjuvants link to a variety of serious autoimmune and inflammatory conditions, and yet kids are given a ton more aluminum in their vaccines. So it just assumed that, oh, you're given a vaccine, you're going to affect the child's brain. We know better. We know that the immune system has a huge effect on the brain. So, the, you know, this whole process plays a huge role on kids' development. So very, very um, challenging situation for us. Um, let's talk a little bit about how we're going to approach it. Obviously, we're not going to send you to be receiving all your vaccines. Um, we, we try to stay clear of, of that uh, function. Um, but what are we going to do? We're going to be looking for underlying causes. How do we do that? We do what's called functional testing. And these are tests that conventional medicine doesn't really run. Uh, insurances don't really cover um, because they're just not um, standard FDA approved you know, approved approach. Uh, food sensitivities. Uh, conventional uh, medicine still doesn't really believe in food sensitivities. They believe in food allergy, like you shrink, you get hives, you get an asthma attack, um, you have anaphylaxis, you die. They believe that, but they don't believe that uh, you have irritable bowel syndrome because you have a dairy sensitivity. They don't buy that, okay? So, of course, they're not going to believe any testing that's looking for something that can believe it. Dysbiosis, lots of medical literature supporting this is so fundamental to our health, and we are just scratching the surface about learning about it. Again, conventional medicine doesn't know how to approach it. In functional medicine, we try and approach it and we use it as a uh, way of getting our patient better. Looking for toxicity. Again, conventional healthcare doesn't really look for toxicity, except for looking at lead in toddlers. That's about probably the only toxicity search that I can think of conventionally. Um, infections, looking for chronic viral infections. A lot of docs still laugh when a patient says, I have Lyme, because they don't believe it. Okay, so, so some of these chronic infections, EBV, oh, yeah, you had EBV, you should be over it. They don't believe that it can lead to chronic illness. Okay, um, nutritional deficiency. Another thing that, you know, the standard approach is, um, you do not need to take vitamins, you get everything from your food. And we know that food doesn't provide all the vitamins you need because of our agricultural practices. And we know that, you know, studies indicate, have proven that the majority of us have multiple nutritional deficiencies. Okay, Adrenal and thyroid hormones play a huge role in how our body functions and responds to stress. Uh, conventional medicine doesn't really believe in adrenal problems unless they're so extreme that the patient can't get out of bed. Uh, then, then, then they'll pay attention to it. Otherwise, they don't. So adrenal fatigue, uh, chronic stress, they don't look at that. And that has a huge impact on the immune system. Thyroid hormones. You know, I struggled so much with a conventional approach. And I know so many patients who have struggled so much with a conventional approach. 
Uh, so these are all things that we address to get people better. And, and this leads to, you know, this little slide I created with a little bit of help uh, that you have to address the foundational pillars of health. You get to address, uh, optimize nutrition, fitness, detoxification, hormones, neuroemotional, so that is stress management, that is uh, your resilience, okay? Uh, critical. If you don't address the whole person and you throw one drug at it, at them, what are you going to expect? You're not going to get the person's health to turn around. You have to address underlying causes, and that's what the pillar represents, okay? So I got another poll for you guys. All right, see if I did this one right. Okay, how many have made diet changes to improve your health? Okay, have you made diet changes? And I'm going to guess the majority have, because every patient I see now has tried multiple different diets. And there are so many out there. Okay, so, yep, looking like 92.7. So the majority have tried to use diet to improve their health. And rightly so, okay. 93 to 6. The majority of you guys have tried. Um, let's talk a little bit about diet here. And this is not a lecture on diet, but, you know, certainly you choose what you eat. You can go to the left or you can go to the right. And you guys know that. And most of this is common sense. I've highlighted some stuff. And, and I, you know, I know most of you guys know that, you know, fatty fish is good for you. Vegetables are good for you. The green leafy stuff is good for you. I threw in some things that people don't necessarily think about. Broccoli sprouts is hugely beneficial for inflammation and cancer even. Um, certain seaweeds, okay, are extremely useful as well, okay. Uh, berries, I think most people know berries are good for you. Sauerkraut because of the probiotics, or the probiotic food, right. Bone broth because of its healing factors, okay. Um, spices, spices are hugely concentrated with antioxidants. Everybody knows about turmeric, right. Uh, curcumin, um, that is uh, gotten a lot of press. There are others, okay? Ginger, rosemary, cinnamon, garlic. These are all standard, right? You guys all got these in your kitchen. Cayenne, black pepper, cloves, there are others. Any spice you can get, you know, get it organic and use a ton of it, okay? Uh, they're, they're all good for you, okay? Obviously, in red with a stop sign, what's bad for you? All right, I think everybody knows. Too much sugar is pro-inflammatory. Too much sugar causes diabetes, causes inflammation, is bad for your brain, and damages every molecule in your body. Okay, so it messes the type of bacteria you have in your gut. So there's no answer around that. It doesn't mean you don't have any sugar. It just means that should really be not your staple. High fructose corn syrup, again, another huge problem, and this is worse even than plain table sugar, okay? So, and that's the cheaper sweetener, and that's what's used in all processed foods. Trans fats, they're illegal in Europe, believe it or not. The Europeans are more mindful of their health than we are here, uh, or our government, I should say, is, more mindful, uh, is less mindful of our health than the European governments are of the Europeans' health. So trans fats are down there, here they're not. We're, uh, they're allowed to put certain amounts in these foods. Vegetable oils, right, they're very high in omega-6 fats, they're inflammatory. Refined carbs, excessive alcohol. Okay, that doesn't mean one glass of red wine in the evening is gonna be bad for you, but it means excessive alcohol is a problem. Uh, hard on your gut too. Processed meats, okay. It's better to not eat any than to eat processed meats, okay? Meats that are charred, don't touch them. They're cancer-causing. The old grilling thing and all that charred meat, that we think again, okay? We really want to watch how we prepare our meat. 
Nightshades, about 10% of people's inflammation is associated with nightshades. That family of vegetables is the tomato, potato, eggplant, uh, peppers, bell peppers, um, not the um, uh, black peppers, but black peppercorns are a whole different family. So that 10% of people are sensitive to that. That's kind of what you're looking to at, pro-inflammatory, anti-inflammatory. All right, um, moderate um, exercise, um, too much exercise known to cause uh, inflammation, right? So marathon runners, oof, their bodies are on fire. You have to, um, a moderate level, we know a lot about optimal exercise. Exercise science has come a long way. So we really, really want to be exercising and be active, breathing, meditation, we need more and more of that as we get more and more stressed. Uh, laugh, you gotta laugh and you gotta enjoy whatever time you have and whatever the circumstances, you've, you've got to be laughing. So the couple there laughing while they're taking a nice brisk walk, awesome, what a combination, okay? So I would encourage everybody to focus on that. Let's talk about some anti-inflammatory supplements. I've kind of given you not necessarily in my order of preference, but these are all things that I think are very important, okay? Dosing varies depending on the patient and what you're trying to achieve, okay? Um, kind of A, B, C, D, that's pretty easy to remember. Magnesium, selenium, zinc are three minerals that are really key in immunity. Um, when COVID hit, a lot of vitamins were hard to obtain. I'm sure you guys saw that. I had a hard time finding vitamins for my patients, even for myself, uh, because people who know these things help. You couldn't find zinc, you couldn't find A, you couldn't find C, okay? D, you could usually find, and, and there's a lot of good data behind D as well. Omega-3s for inflammation, that omega-3-6 ratio. Um, Top two herbal products, boswellia and curcumin, probably um, kind of top that list. Again, as I said, a lot of herbs are very, very beneficial. So, so nutrition supplemented with um, vitamins and such is key. Now I'm going to get into kind of the, the really cool things I wanted to present to you guys. And this is a little bit of a summary that uh, says when we'll go down this uh, um, sequence, Fasting, LDA, low-dose allergen immunotherapy, and low-dose immunotherapy, LDI, I'll explain those too, ozone and prolozone, and intravenous vitamin C, okay? Please, for pain, you just have to be in a webinar on vitamin C. Here it is again, okay? Um, so let's start rolling. Fasting. Fasting is something that is, you know, it's in a lot of cultures, traditionally, a lot of religions have various forms of fasting, okay? And there is a lot of empirical and observational evidence about how useful it is, okay? Um, it is useful in treatment of rheumatic diseases, chronic pain, high blood pressure, obviously diabetes, metabolic syndrome, but there's no double-blind placebo-controlled trials. I guess it's hard to do double-blind fasting study because you either feed somebody or you don't, and they're going to know the difference. See, some of these studies, uh, you know, conventional doctors are taught not to look at anything that's not double-blind placebo-controlled. Well, lifestyle, you can't really double-blind placebo-controlled, okay? So you're going to be you're doing observational, okay, and empirical studies, and fasting has a lot of history behind it, okay? Um, there are beneficial effects of fasting followed then by a, you know, modification in the diet, okay? Going along those anti-inflammatory um, uh, eating choices, okay? Um, Dr. Longo is a researcher uh, on aging, and he has developed a fasting mimicking diet which means you're not totally fasting, you're not just uh, having nothing by mouth or just water, uh, but he has kind of determined a certain caloric mix at a very low caloric intake uh, makes fasting easier. So you can get in there and go through a five-day fast, 
without too much difficulty. He, he allows you enough food. And he's proven that that has similar benefits on immunity as does a full fast, okay? Now, I will caution you, do not fast without proper medical supervision if you have any health-related issues. If you are on no medications and you have no health problems that have been diagnosed, you can fast away. I, I think you would be fine, okay? Again, within reason. But for those of you that are on medications, no, you can't. You, you have got to be under a doctor's care because you can get yourself into trouble fast with fasting, okay? But it is an immensely powerful tool. So definitely something that we don't utilize, okay? So fasting is one extremely strong weapon I think we have against inflammation that we don't use. Another one is the LDA, okay? So let's talk a little bit about LDA. We, um, and, and that term molecular mimicry that I went to Lentz uh, explaining to you guys. So LDA is developed as an allergy therapy and it kind of was found incidentally by um, a doctor in England doing research on nasal polyps and he found that what he was putting in the nose into the polyps was actually proving people's allergies and they worked backwards, identified the substance and so forth. And, and he has developed into an allergy therapy with about 130 doctors in the world that use this technique. Um, when it first came to the U.S. around 1970, there was a huge study planned, um, an FDA trial, and uh, there were 100 doctors enrolled in this, and a bunch of patients started on the therapy. The serum was coming from England, and for some, whatever reason, FDA says, nope, this is coming from another country, we can't be using this, and they just banned the trial. And there were a ton of patients and doctors that had just seen miraculous responses and allergy with this. And so um, Dr. Butch Schrader, uh, who just actually retired from practice, uh, is credited with bringing this therapy to the US. And uh, he was spearheading that uh, trial. And then when it was no longer available because the FDA banned it, they, um, he found a way to have it manufactured here in the US. And so now it's made here and, and we I'm one of the docs that uses this therapy for allergy. Uh, it was found by Dr. Schrader and others that you could make a vaccine using this concept of molecular mimicry and you could actually turn off certain autoimmune diseases. Okay, that was pretty cool. So um, the instead of using pollen as the substance to which you were trying to desensitize a person, it became that you took dead bacterial antigens, for example, from Proteus bacterium, from Klebsiella bacterium, and you took those dead antigens, little pieces of the bacteria, and you made a little vaccine with it. The point of the LDA vaccine is to introduce this mixture to the patient's immune system and say, hey, this is okay. Don't attack. Don't react. Okay? So it kind of tames the immune system. It doesn't turn it off. It's not a steroid. It's not a drug. It's not a biologic. Okay? But it tones down the immune response so that the body doesn't go crazy. Hey, what? And so it was found that by using this, certain patients' uh, ankylosing spondylitis symptoms or their rheumatoid arthritis symptoms would respond. Okay? Um, and in, in respond, I mean, you get a shot and it kicks in about four or five days later and the patient notices, you know, a 50, 60% improvement in their symptoms. And that improvement then would usually wear off after so many weeks. And then the next LDA uh, vaccine would be dosed and uh, the patient would again be better. And over time, their immune system calmed down and this has been found to be quite successful. I have personally used it in many patients with good benefit. Now, again, I don't do it in isolation. I focus on their nutrition. I supplement them with proper nutrients, and, and it's a total program to, to put together. But this is really uh, can have a dramatic effect in patients that have allergic diseases 
or autoimmune disease. So uh, very, very cool stuff. And this works through that molecular mimicry, as I explained. So we're giving the immune system these little bit of bacteria stuff that we think there's a cross-reaction part of the immune system saying, hey, don't react to this. And then the immune system chills on attacking the person's joints, okay? Ozone therapy, okay. So I got another poll, guys. So let's pull up the poll. And the poll says, I can get to there. Aha, here it is. Very simple. Have you heard of ozone or prozone therapy? Okay, so those are my patients. I bet most of you guys have, and the ones who are not may not have. So let's just see. Because about half the audience I know personally are patients, the other half is not. So I'm anticipating somewhere it should be around half and half. And most of it should be half saying yes, we know. All right. Come on, everybody. Look at in there, yes or no. So it looks like we are getting... Ah, interesting. 64% have heard of it and 35, 33% have not. Uh, we count to five and then we'll end this poll. All right, so that's where we're at. So two thirds have heard of, awesome. Okay, well, you guys are here on this webinar for a reason. You're seeking out these things and, and that's the, how people find. If you ask your doctors, I bet you they've never heard of them. Okay, if they have, they're afraid. They think ozone is, you know, that atmospheric gas in the... Uh... So there we go, 60, 40, 60 have heard of this, okay? Uh, let's go back and talk about ozone. So ozone, it is the same ozone that is in the atmosphere. We have an ozone layer. Remember that uh, those little uh, spray can things were destroying and the ozone layer protects us from the sun's radiation. And when there is a thunderstorm, ozone is generated by the action of lightning, electricity, on oxygen in the atmosphere. And so what is ozone? Ozone is um, oxygen that is not O2, not two molecules of oxygen, but three. Ozone is an unstable form of oxygen. It wants to react with things, okay? Um, so if you have just plain straight ozone, it's gonna react to whatever, and you can use it as a very potent agent to kill germs okay in fact they make little ozone machines you can put in uh if you want to sanitize a place you can't really stand there because it's irritating to the lungs you'd have to leave but people ozonate their homes it knocks out the uh, mold it knocks out the antigens things fall out of the air it's it totally uh can be used as an awesome sanitizing agent you can also there are ozone uh, machines made to wash your clothes so you don't have to buy laundry detergent. There are also ozone can be bubbled through your um, jug full of blueberries with water in there and it can sanitize and sterilize them. So there are those, but we're interested in medical ozone and what the heck is medical ozone. So doctors that are trained in this, specifically trained, know how to use ozone safely in the body, okay? The lungs do not like ozone. So you don't wanna stand there and breathe ozone, okay? Um, but we can't actually even get it to the lungs. We just have to run it through some oil and generate compounds called ozonides. And those don't irritate the lungs and they can have a very beneficial effect. Um, but ozone is something we can do a blood treatment with. We can um, insufflate it into a body cavity, like the rectum, okay? That sounds good, right? A rectal enema with gas. Uh, it can be pretty amazingly therapeutic. Um, we draw out some blood, um, we mix it with ozone, we, we infuse it back into the patient. There's a systemic treatment that balances the immune system. So a hyperactive immune system like an autoimmune disease will calm down, and an underactive immune system in the case of chronic infection will wake up. So it has an immune balancing effect, which is pretty cool. We can inject this into the body, into soft tissue, into joints, 
okay, into tendons and ligaments and encourage healing. It is pretty amazing. Um, we'll talk a little bit about how um, exactly you're going to do that. Uh, ozone therapy, patient response. Uh, and I can tell you, Kelly literally looked like this. She liked her ozone therapy. Uh, it's, uh, and she had allergies as well. That was one of her problems. And, and this really agreed with her. Um, the um, ozone therapy and CoQ10, CoQ10 is an antioxidant. Ozone therapy supports antioxidant uh, function and pre uh, prevents what we call oxidative damage. And you can say that's kind of like rusting. That's how we rust, this little oxidative damage which messes up everything. So, so they looked at markers in the blood, um, oxidative stress markers, and they were better when this combination was used. Now, when you use a combination, you don't know how much effect it belong to which, okay? So um, there is a lot of published medical literature. Again, your doctor's never heard of this. So if it's so good, why doesn't my doctor know about it? Well, it's all over the medical literature, but your doctor cannot monitor and know the whole medical literature. They only know where somebody points them. So if they attend a conference, if a drug rep comes in, they're only going to hear selective things, okay? Unless they're open-minded and seeking a solution, kind of like people like me, um, we will come upon these therapies, okay? So that's why the doctor hasn't heard about it. Um, this is something that is known that a lot of work has been done looking at how it works and why it works. We know it upregulates antioxidant systems. So it's like taking antioxidants without taking those supplements. So it activates immune function as well as suppresses inflammation. How cool is that? A balancing effect, okay? So this is very beneficial. Diabetics are always inflamed and on fire. So it is useful in diabetics as one of the points of the study. Um, this is George. After four treatments, I noticed the brain fog was pretty much gone. Okay, so that oxygenation, that balancing out immunity makes a huge impact. You know, they're saying a lot of psychiatric disease, schizophrenia, depression, anxiety relates to brain inflammation. And so we need to get the brain oxygen and we need to cut the inflammation. That's how we're going to get it better. Okay? Energy can improve. So prozone therapy, right? Um, how many have had prozone therapy? Um, I think I know some of you guys have because I have administered prozone therapy to you. So if you would, go ahead and put into the chat uh, what your experience with this has been. Uh, it's not unusual for a patient to say it was like a miracle because it makes such a dramatic effect. And the cool thing is the benefit is instant. The majority of cases will have instant improvement, okay? Now, sometimes there's a delayed effect, okay? Like one of my patients... Uh, was actually in today for a second uh, prozone injection. Um, he noticed that his headache went away 48 hours later, but the pain in the neck responded right away. So, so there is, and, and we can inject all kinds of places, right? Um, there's almost no limit to where we can put it. Obviously, not into the lungs. You don't want to inject the lungs. But so, prozone has a very um, amazing effect in that it cuts inflammation, and it encourages healing, okay? Now, the equivalent under conventional medicine, uh, you know, approach is going to be a steroid shot. So what you're getting with a steroid shot is it messes up your own adrenal function for about the next six weeks. Yeah, six weeks. And it does cut inflammation, but in the process damages the joint. There is increased degeneration. So you do a series of these, and then you're going to guarantee that that knee is going to need to be replaced. Okay? But you don't have that with prozone. With prozone, every time you do it, you are improving the health of the tissues and the health of the body. And that is what, to me, is really amazing. So we can inject little joints, like in the finger, 
uh, we can do this for plantar fasciitis. We can do it for, um, uh, you know, um, tennis elbow. We can obviously do it for chronic knee, hip, shoulder, rotator cuff, okay? Um, carpal tunnel. All of these indications can benefit from this, okay? Now, in terms of uh, where exactly uh, does one inject? It depends on the lead, uh, problem. We're doing two things here with prolozone. And notice there's a pro part at the beginning of the ozone word. So it's a combination treatment, ozone, but it's preceded by kind of a prolo. Prolotherapy was something that was developed before prolozone, and it involves injecting irritating substances that trigger a healing response. Tends to be painful. Um, Dr. Frank Schallenberger is credited with doing a blend of injecting uh, a mixture of prolo. Uh, in his case, he doesn't use irritating substances, he uses vitamins and then and some uh, numbing medication. And this is followed by the injection of the gas into the joint or soft tissue. And so when we're injecting into the knee, for example, we can hear as the gas goes in, the knee will make noises as the gas shifts around. And, and when you inject it in soft tissue, you can feel that nice crispy sensation uh, in the tissue. So, so it's a combination. First, we're gonna inject the vitamins and then we're gonna inject the ozone and there's gonna be immediate pain relief. And, and what's really cool is it can be uh, dramatically effective. Um, so I, I have a little, video. Let's see if I can I'm trying to uh, share this with you guys. This is Michelle. And I had a hard time even walking. Um, going down was terrible. I had to go one step at a time, like I was like 90. <laughs> and, um, going up the hill was really bad. It just hurt. It was just getting to the point hurt all the time. So I received one shot and it is, I would say, 75% to 80% better. Um, still hurts if I go on a long hike uphill, but um, it has been a miracle. So I love it. Okay. Here we go. So, um, yeah, and, and that's not unusual where she had so much pain, it was really getting hard for her to walk around. And then one injection and she's, oh my God, you know, 75, 80% better. Um, yeah. And, and we don't just stop at one injection because the next one's going to get them even more better. And many patients after a series of three to five um, will do quite well. And then they might not come back for a year, two years, say, okay, I think I want to touch up. Um, in general, uh, it works exceedingly well. And again, there is no negative side effect to it. It's not going to damage anything. Okay. So, um, Bill, Bill had a lot of pain. He had a lot of other symptoms too. And again, we worked with him holistically. But this poor fellow had had back surgery a couple of times. He had had surgery on his elbow. He had had steroid injections there. And his arm hurt him so much that lifting a TV remote would cause pain. And, and, and it was like amazing. One injection and then for four months he had no pain. Okay. And, and that was the last follow up I have, but no pain. His back, um, he, he, this guy just completely could not function and everything got so much better for him. He was starting to repair things around the house and do all kinds of things. Um, so huge, huge impact. So again, this is also published, you know, guys, I'm not making this up. This is not uh, voodoo. This is published in the standard accepted medical literature, okay? This is a meta-analysis. That means they're comparing multiple studies. Intra-articular ozone injected into the joint is what that means, is an effective way for chronic pain management, okay, of knee osteoarthritis, okay? How many orthopedists uh, docs give you this choice? They don't. 
I, I've tried. I've tried getting. Uh, I have a friend who's an orthopedic uh, surgeon, and I said, "Hey, hey, you gotta, you gotta come do this with me." And and he says, "Oh, I need to see literature." I sent him, I don't know, ten different studies. No answer. No reply. They, they're just not interested. They know what they know, and and it stops there. But you know, this this needs to become mainstream. It really needs to be available to everybody. Okay. Spinal pain, there are people using ozone under fluoroscopy. I don't do that. I don't inject into the spine, but I will inject paraspinal into the musculature, and that can have a huge effect. And this paper is saying that um, this paper finds, fa uh, let's see, finds favors the full insertion of ozone therapy into pharmaceutical sciences rather than than as an alternative or esoteric approach. And you know, the people are gonna demand what they're gonna demand and they're going to turn conventional medicine into alternative medicine and vice versa. Because, um, you know, people know what they need. Uh, this is uh, Michelle's uh, story and summary. Let's get to the vitamin C. We did a whole webinar on this uh, last week and I think that was pretty phenomenal, amazing vitamin C just continues to uh, amaze me. Um, I'm going to give you guys one more little poll here. Let's see here. Get to the right poll. There we go. So how many of you guys know of vitamin C as being an intravenous treatment, not just a pill that you take? Okay, so far everybody, and I don't know. People that know me probably know it. So got 75, 60, 75 know that it can be used intravenously. I bet you 75% of medical doctors don't know that. It is pretty amazing. People are seeking out these natural solutions because they're tired of the Band-Aid approach with drug medicine. Okay, 6831, 638 know about it. So let me tell you some other pretty cool stuff that it does. Uh, pain, vitamin C administration can exhibit analgesic properties, okay? In some situations, we'll go through what situations, okay? Uh, acute herpes, now that's a virus, so obviously it would make sense. It's gonna treat virus uh, infection, and it's going to help. Post-herpetic uh, neuralgia, and that's like shingles. Some people have debilitating pain after shingles, and, and IV vitamin C helps to expedite recovery from that. Cancer-related pain is another big one, okay? So these are uh, huge areas where cancer patients notice a marked improvement in pain as well as their quality of life. So, so this is, there you go, randomized placebo-controlled crossover trial, okay? This is uh, osteoarthritis in the hip joint or knee joint. Um, again, this is what the docs are looking for. Look at the article, article in Danish, of course. It's not in English. How could your doctors read it, okay? There's always an abstract in English, and we can, these days on Google, we can translate almost anything with a click of a button. So, so no excuses, guys. IV vitamin C, rheumatoid arthritis. That's pretty cool, okay? Um, and it can calm down the inflammation in rheumatoid arthritis. There's a lot of mechanisms by which vitamin C works, and, and we're talking high doses. If you go home and take vitamin C tablets, not gonna quite turn off the inflammation. Um, but taking it intravenously in these higher doses can really quench a lot of free radicals, calm the inflammation, and thereby help. They measured in the study something called CRP, C-reactive protein, and it decreased 44%. That's pretty huge. And that's a marker for inflammation, okay? So, so they're saying, hey, this is a strategy we should think about with rheumatoid arthritis. But the uh, you know, rheumatologists that treat rheumatoid arthritis they only know drug. You start with this drug, then you go to that drug, then you go to that drug. Uh, using, you know, here we're not using the vitamin as a vitamin. 
and then you're actually using the vitamin as a drug. But how cool is that? It has beneficial side effects instead of negative side effects. Okay, so this is RA, rheumatoid arthritis, fatigue, and insomnia in this patient. All three measures get dramatically better. Okay, so I don't know. Is there a hidden infection with this patient? Is that what the IV vitamin C is doing? Or is it other, other uh, mechanisms? We know it cuts inflammation, and we also know it's antimicrobial, and maybe it's a combination effect, because we don't know. These hidden infections are hard for doctors to diagnose. So, all right, we are getting there. Um, this is really cool, 50 milligrams per kilogram. Uh, that tells the dose intravenously, not orally, um, given um, made a difference. So this is where they gave patients a placebo. Either they gave them vitamin C or they just gave them a bag of saline liquid, salt water. Okay. And there was a very dramatic benefit. So that's pretty cool. And yet these poor patients are given nothing but narcotics. 